Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kevin Muehlman, and I'm an external affairs associate here at Washington, NYU Washington, D.C., and I work with the John Bradmas Center. Uh, inspired by its founder, the former congressman and NYU President Emeritus, the John Bradmas Center of New York University pursues a collection of initiatives in the areas which form the core of John Bradmas' John Bradmas's life in public service. The Bradmas Center undertakes programs at NYU's campuses in New York City and in Washington, D.C., and um, occasionally on other sites around the globe. Uh, thank you for coming here. Um, if this is a great opportunity to turn off your cell phones during the film, and then um, we'll have a panel discussion after the uh, film is over, and you can keep your phones off for that as well. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank a few people. Uh, Thomas McIntyre, he's a deputy director of programming and outreach of the Bradman Center here at NYU. Um, and also the NYU Glo College of Global Public Health. Without them, this event would not have been possible. Um, specifically, I'd like to thank Nina Raffio. Uh, she's the events planner and helped you uh, check in this morning or this evening. Um, and then also Julia Cartwright. She's the Senior Associate Dean uh, for Communications, Promotion, and Public Affairs. Uh, in a few moments, you're going to be seeing a film by Brendan Lavoy. Uh, it's The Hometown, a portrait of the American opioid epidemic. In this documentary, uh, it explores a multifaceted issue of addiction and those whose lives it affects. The story is about Shane Walsh, who passed away from a fentanyl overdose, but it is also about how opioids have come to take such a powerful hold on small communities and the people in them. Shane Walsh could be anyone's child, friend, or loved one, and Salem, New Hampshire could be anyone's hometown. Through this film, Brendan Lavoy hopes to break the present stigma surrounding addiction and those suffering from it. For those of you who are joining us online, um, you are not able to see the film on that, but there is a link that you can go to to watch the film and then just come back around 7 o'clock for the panel discussion. Um, so during that uh, discussion, we have uh, Alex Ginsberg. She is the Senior Legislative and Federal Affairs Officer for the American Psychological Association's Education Government Relations Office. She is she since joining the organization in 2012, Ginsburg has supported APA's key education advocacy priorities on Capitol Hill, including increasing federal support for the psychology workforce to expand access to high quality mental and behavioral health services in at risk communities. Um, Brandon Lavoy is the film producer, director, writer, and cinematographer working a across documentary, narrative, and commercial disciplines. Brandon's passion for intimate, character-driven stories was developed through osmosis when he got his start working for two-time Academy Award-winning uh, documentary film, uh, filmmaker Barbara Coppel. And also Dr. Courtney McKnight. Um, she is a clinical assistant professor of epidemiology at NYU College of Global Public Health. Dr. McKnight is a principal investigator specializing in mixed methods, methods research focused on the epidemiology of drug use, opioid overdose, HIV, and HCV infection. Dr. McKnight has over 20 years of experience conducting public health research related to drug use, as well as field experience as a harm reduction service provider. Dr. McKnight, McKnight's current research interests include examining the shifting landscape of opioids, including the increasing prevalence of manufactured uh, fentanyl and risk environments of people who use drugs. Um, the moderator is going to be Mary Ellen McIntyre. Uh, Mary Ellen is a staff writer for CQ Roll Call, covering health care, politics, and policy. She has reported and written on the affordable health care, prescription drug prices, the opioid crisis, and mental health issues, among other things. She is a New Hampshire native and graduate of the George Washington University. Um, after the program, which is going to last about 45 minutes, and then we're going to have an opportunity for you to ask questions as well, and that's going to be about 15 minutes. Um, and then after that, we will be um, having a light reception with some hors d'oeuvres and wine upstairs. So please feel free to join us for that. But without further ado, uh, let's get the film started. Happy to be here with all of you today. Um, 
guess we'll get right into it. Brandon, I wanted to start with you. Um, and actually, your film really struck home with me because I grew up about 20 minutes outside of Salem, and my mom grew up in Salem. So I've spent a lot of time in the area, recognized a lot of it. I was hoping you could kind of just start off by telling us a bit about the backstory to the film, um, you know, how you kind of came across this story, and how the story sort of builds into this and is an example of this broader issue. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming out, guys. Um, so what kind of got my attention is I graduated from high school in 2010. Um, and since then, uh, mostly on Facebook and social media, I had seen a lot of the people that I graduated, um, their obituaries. So um, New Hampshire has a really, it's a pretty bad problem with the opiates, uh, like every state in the US right now. Um, but when I started seeing more and more people that I knew, uh, I felt a little compelled to do something about it. And you can only do so much when you're 24 or 25. Um, but when Shane passed away, he was someone that I had classes with. He was someone that uh, I worked at the grocery store with, um, stock shelves with. Like, So it was a little more personal because I had so much like rapport with him. Um, and so I sent a message to his mother on Facebook like two months after he passed away, which looking back was a little fresh, um, and uh, asked if she would be willing to let me talk to her and do a project about Shane and his life, and uh, she was good with it, and it kind of just evolved from there, talking to as many people as possible, and then um, the editor, Brady, kind of just like figuring out a way to put it together. but. Yeah. And it sort of broadens this out. I mean, this is, as you sort of said, an issue that so many families across the country deal with. How do you kind of see this example and pictured here in the film as sort of an example of the broader issue that the opioid epidemic is really hitting across the country? So I can speak to that a little bit. So I, um, I do research um, with people who use drugs, um, mostly opioids, but um, sort of people that are uh, using a lot of drugs and are kind of further along in the process. Typically, I recruit from places like drug treatment programs and uh, syringe service programs. And so, I, I, one, I thought your film was beautiful. I think you did a great job of um, really kind of, uh, of showing a picture of people who use drugs as not one-dimensional. And I think um, his mother did a great job as well of honoring him. Um, but so I just wrapped up a study uh, where I was interviewing 18 to 30 year olds who were um, using opioids as well, mostly heroin users, um, and talked to them a lot about fentanyl. And I think um, Shane's story, I mean, it was like, there's a very similar pattern. Um, it was so similar to a lot of the stories I heard, um, you know, people uh, either using, um, Oxycontin at parties, like as teenagers. So, you know, I think maybe when some of us grew up, people at parties were using maybe uh, alcohol or marijuana, but um, opioids have been so increasingly available, or at least at a period of time, maybe 10 years ago, maybe not so much anymore, um, that uh, there was just more exposure to them. And then people that actually uh, got addicted to them at some point. Some of those people, not everyone, but some of those people actually transitioned to heroin use because we, you know, through regulation, did um, manage to reduce um, prescription opioids to some extent, but uh, it creates dependency and therefore people still uh, needed to use because they were addicted. So I think, you know, this story, um, your film does a great job of really um, diving into the issue and um, and doing it with just like a lot of heart. Thank you. Um, I'm with the American Psychological Association and um, at APA our work to broadly um, increase access to psychological services in underserved areas and that's one thing with the opioid epidemic that we see which is that people aren't A, they're not seeking treatment um, and B, that where services are needed the most that's where the services lack the most. So implementing policies and programs that recruit and retain um, high quality mental and behavioral health professionals to these really underserved areas. Um, and I, you know, re this message really resonated with me, what you said, is, which is that, um, you know, I also grew up on, on Facebook, you see more and more people who are posting things about substance use disorder problems or things like that. And I think um, 
what's very um, related to something that you said that's interesting is the the transition to addiction, right? So um, I, you know, similar to Shane, I had a knee problem when I was 16. Um, and there's something different here. And I was in the hospital and people, you know, I'm sure every, you know, majority of people here have had their wisdom teeth taken out. Um, People are exposed to opioids early on in life, but it's not everybody who develops addiction. There are a certain set of environmental and social circumstances that um, create situations that are really, you know, create problematic situations that, um, which are kind of ripe for addiction, you know? Yeah, definitely. One um, thing from the film that really stuck with me was when the police officer from Salem was speaking with an addict and, you know, was talking to him about his history with drugs and he said, the doctors did this to me, like the doctors got me addicted. and. To your point, prescribing practices for prescription, opi prescription pills have changed, but heroin, fentanyl are still out there on the market and easily accessible. Um, what sort of further types of changes in that do you do past prescription changes? Where that being how a lot of people get stuck is, you know, a knee injury or wisdom teeth removal. I can um, try to answer that to begin with. Um, I would say that um, something also that's very interesting about the opioid epidemic is that. Um, it prioritizes um, kind of quick fix approaches to pain and the management of pain. And as it stands right now, it's just much easier for a patient to get a prescription to Percocet or something like that when they have a knee injury to non-pharmacologic alternatives to pain. Um, psychologists provide non-pharmacologic -pharm alternatives to pain, uh, physical therapists, things like that. So opioids are still really uh, being, they're being used as the frontline approach to treat pain when there are, are alternatives, but people don't have access to the alternatives. What do you guys think about sort of the way that these issues are being policed and how has that changed as this issue has become more pre prevalent in various communities, not only in cities, but in small towns in New Hampshire, and it's just sort of become a broader issue across the board? Um, I think it's been prioritized, and this is really unfortunate. Um, I think once it started popping up in the suburbs, people prioritized it more. Um, and when it was more of an urban problem that you would find in inner cities, it wasn't as much of a priority uh, to address. And I think that says something bigger. Um, but. Um, I think now with the idea of introducing like safe injection sites um, and sort of trying to break the stigma of people under the bridge and, and something like that, um, you know, the, the progress is being made, but uh, there is no quick fix. Um, I think more in terms of like the policing, I think there needs to be a little bit more of a lenient stance taken on the people suffering from addiction um, and in terms of the people selling it. Um, that's a, uh, yeah, it's another topic. They're doing it. I mean, when you spoke with police officers, did you find that, that their approaches to doing this has changed as, it, as their communities have become more and it's more of an issue that they're dealing with frequently, do you think? Um, yeah, I think their approach to, it was interesting because the Lawrence police officer um, he's, you know, he made a great point where he said uh, during our interview, like p people from Lawrence still go knocking on people's doors in New Hampshire saying, hey, do you want to buy some heroin? Um, if you look at it, uh, Lawrence has one of the highest sales rate of opiates, but it also has one of the lowest usage rates of opiates. So uh, in some cases, people look at it like a business. Uh, they're trying to feed a family. So there's always like two sides to a story. So a police officer in an urban environment may have a little bit more understanding of someone who's selling opiates on the streets, whereas a police officer in the suburbs may, you know, there's a, there's a way tougher stance taken, uh, you know, if you're caught selling in the suburbs or, um, but yeah, I mean, I think everyone's still trying to navigate it. Um, there's like no easy way to do it. I just want to make a couple of points about that. So I think first in terms of uh, addressing this, we clearly need a multi-pronged approach, right? So we need prevention um, and that would be reducing the amount of opioids. And to your point, you know, there was a, an article that just came out in JAMA about the fact that um, a lot of young people are exposed to opioids for the first time through wisdom teeth extraction and that um, opioids are actually not very effective, like um, acetaminophen or, or um, 
uh, ibuprofen is actually more effective. And so to the extent that we can um, use evidence-based approaches um, to actually treat pain or conditions, um, I think we'll be in a better place um, rather than being sort of driven um, by pharma. Um, and in, in terms of the policing piece, I think it's complex. And the notion of a dealer is also complex. Um, there's been a bit written about this and a lot of conversation about this right now as we move more towards a, an approach to um, go after dealers when someone uh, dies from a heroin or a fentanyl overdose. Um, and that is a very complex issue. A lot of times the dealers on the streets have no idea that there's fentanyl in their product. And those might be the people that end up in jail. Um, and so I think, and, and you know, as well, I mean, there have certainly been cases where um, someone is labeled a dealer when they're using with a friend um, and two people use together and that person will end up getting arrested if they didn't overdose. Um, so it, it's very complex and the notion of uh, dealers are complex. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's, but again, it's going to, you, you said safer consumption spaces. I'm in New York and um, they were just recently approved. It looks like we're going to have some uh, sites in New York. And those are one approach um, to trying to reduce the harm. Because I think, you know, so we have to do prevention. We also have to um, increase access to treatment particularly evidence-based treatment like medication-assisted treatment. But then we also have to have services for people that continue to use drugs or people that are coming out of jail. You know, we know that um, people are at their highest risk for overdose when they come out of jail, when they come out of treatment, right? Because they have stopped using, but they might start, one, they might be exposed to fentanyl if they decide to use. So they have no tolerance, and then if they buy a bag of heroin that has fentanyl in it, they're more likely to overdose because it's so much stronger. And similarly, people coming out of treatment as well. And so I think we really need to sort of um, look across the spectrum and not just focus on prevention, but we need to focus on treatment as well as services to, uh, evidence-based services to people that are continuing to use drugs. With a lot of folks about is making sure that if people are in prison or spending time in jail, that they're getting access to treatment during that process. Um, I'm curious, did the police officers that you spoke with carry naloxone on them at all times? Uh, yes, um, oh, always. Uh, and there were some characters that just didn't make it into the film. There was one uh, gentleman that I spent some time with, and um, he kind of just drives around and has a police radio, and if he hears a overdose get called in or something of that nature. He just shows up and like no one knows how he got his naloxone because it's not readily available or at least it wasn't at the time. Uh, I'm actually not sure if that's changed. Um, but yes, uh, all the police had it. One thing that struck me I, over the past year, I believe it was the Surgeon General came out and said in a statement, people should start carrying naloxone in their purse or their briefcase if you're around someone who might overdose regularly, and to me that was just a really like, the fact that it would be that available when just a few years ago it was such a big thing for a police officer to be carrying it around. Um, kind of stepping back a little bit and looking at some of the policy um, proposals that we've seen go through in the past year. So I cover Congress, um, I've covered two opioid bills, most recently a pretty big one passed this past year, um, and one of the main things that you, we heard about that was there's no silver bullet, there's no one step. You have to have a multi-pronged approach to resolving this crisis, but at the same time, nothing you do is ever gonna be enough because this is something that's killing a lot of people every day. Um, I'm curious what you guys think of the proposals that have advanced so far and how, how you've seen them working um, up to this point. Um, I can say that um, I think anybody who works on these issues, um, you know, better than nothing. <laughs> so that's great, you know, every, you know, everybody worked really hard on this bill, Congress worked really hard on this bill, um, just on the House side alone, you know, you covered it. Um, it, there were more than 70 proposals combined. I think that um, there's never necessarily going to be a perfect bill, we need a bill that, you know, just off the top of my head, we need to increase access to non-pharmacological non alternatives to care, we need to support the continuum of care for those with substance use disorders, including opioid use disorders. Um, we need to expand federal research um, on the prevention side and the treatment side. We need to invest in the treatment workforce. Um, and we need to support long-term recovery. So there's a lot, it's so, there, you know, there are a lot of prongs, there's a lot of things to support. I would say that um, as it stands with the bill that just passed, um, 
the next step in the process would be getting more funding for these programs. Um, it didn't provide a lot of funding, uh, not nearly enough funding for what's actually needed to um, address this epidemic. What do you think are the odds of, of additional funding coming in the next couple of years given the sharply partisan Congress that we have these days? Um, I think there's real bipartisan support behind this issue because of something that you said, which is that this is really affecting um, all states out there. I think that one thing we should be careful of with that particular bill is that from a public health perspective, most, um, you know, most experts, you probably would have something to say about this, this epidemic hasn't peaked yet. Um, and what we should be careful of is a giant bill that treats opioid use disorder when there's a spectrum of substance use disorders that this bill doesn't address. So there's alcoholism and other forms of addiction that isn't necessarily included in this bill. So we should be careful about you know 15 years from now um, just having policies that are geared towards opioids. And that's the, that's the end of that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, you know, uh, drug use can be cyclical, right? So we are we are definitely in the midst of an opioid epidemic. I, I don't think I need to tell anyone that, but um, we're also starting to see increasing evidence of uh, uh, increased stimulant use. So um, I was just in um, four different cities in upstate New York, um, and uh, was interviewing people 18 to 30 years old, and the most frequently reported drug was methamphetamine. Um, all of, but all of those folks were also using um, opioids and had their major drug of addiction was opioids, and now uh, most of them were using methamphetamine. Um, many of them combined with opioids, um, but I was also recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, at the American Public Health Association Conference in San Diego and um, presented on a panel about fentanyl and was talking to um, my co-presenters and then a couple, in other, couple other sessions about um, sort of having a broader approach to drug use and reducing the harms um, and uh, other people like in um, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, Florida, were and Delaware were saying that they're starting to see an increase in methamphetamine use as well. So I think to the extent that we can kind of um, sit with what's happening right now, but really try and take a couple steps back and think about the fact that you know it might be opioids now, but in 10 to 15 years, like we don't want to get surprised by, you know, I think we should have been dealing with this in the way that we are now. Um, many years ago, if not decades, and we don't want to get surprised with methamphetamine or some other stimulant in, in a similar way. I'll admit, when I started having lawmakers tell me in the spring, asking about, you know, how is this opioid bill coming on, and a few members started talking about methamphetamine being a really big issue in their district, and I was personally very taken aback by that, because it's not something that you would expect to hear um, as sort of the drug of choice. Um, but it seems like that's something that seems easier to, for people to access, maybe? So I, in trying to understand what was happening in these upstate cities um, that I was at, I was talking to some folks from the DEA. Um, and it's my understanding that, um, a lot. well, one, we know that um, methamphetamine trafficking in the United States, um, it, well, that most of the methamphetamine in the United States used to be made by people. Um, and now what we're really starting to see is a shift in the marketplace, similar to what we saw with heroin and fentanyl, in that um, most of the methamphetamine, especially you know what we're seeing on the East Coast, um, is actually being brought in from Mexico. Um, and it's often being trafficked by the same cartels that are bringing heroin and, um, and fentanyl. So, uh, you know, that might have something to do with it. You know, I've heard lots of different things about um, how um, cartels are trying to find marketplaces for methamphetamine. This methamphetamine that they're seeing is much more potent and cheap, very, very cheap. Um, I'm curious what you guys think of the announcement this weekend um, that China is going to be more closely regulating and labeling fentanyl, and what does this mean in the big picture for the US? I think we need to, I, I just heard a story on NPR actually right before I came um, down here um, about this. And I, I, you know, to the extent that we can try and reduce supply as much as possible is, is what we should be doing. Um, I, you know, they're, with fentanyl in particular, so fentanyl analogs um, can range in potency from one and a half to 10,000 times more potent than morphine. And, um, 
in Ohio, I was just reading something about Dayton, Ohio, that saw, it was a story in the New York Times, I think it was last year, um, where their medical examiner, they had so many overdose deaths that they actually had to um, uh, rent refrigerated trucks to house um, people that were they were waiting to do autopsies on, and they've reduced their um, mort overdose uh, opioid mortality um, significantly. Um, and I think that uh, to the ex they, but they were also seeing major um, deaths related to carfentanil, which is the very very potent um, fentanyl that we don't see everywhere. Um, but they saw a lot of it, particularly in Dayton. Um, and that is, you know, so one of the ways that, that they responded was having higher dose naloxone, um, which can, you know, be more effective. Um, but they also, you know, looked at Medicaid expansion in 2015, Ohio um, had Medicaid expansion. And so, you know, increasing as access to treatment is helpful. But to get back to your question <laughs> about China, I think to the extent that we can regulate it, I think, you know, it's incredibly potent. And, and the more that we can diminish the supply side, um, the better. I kind of going off of your point there, um, in terms of, you know, I saw that story about Ohio in times also. Um, I think we've seen some of really interesting responses from states like Ohio and West Virginia that have really been hit by this. What do you guys kind of see as the best examples of states that have been hit with this issue, trying to respond to it in innovative ways? Obviously, states are strapped for money, but they are trying to you know, address this issue the best they can. In terms of a specific state, um, I'm not sure I can give a great example of a specific state. Um, but. I know Massachusetts in particular, because uh, I'm from that area. Uh, New Jersey, I see a lot of advertisements on the subway. Um, it's if if you try and take a more human, like it, these states that are trying to put advertisements out or um, just PSAs, making it a little bit more human, um, trying to break a stigma that like everyone who does who's addicted to opioids or, or just addicted to anything in general is is dirty. Um, I think those are the states that are really seeing, uh, like, improvement. Um, I know in Gloucester, Massachusetts, um, the police department there has done, has made tremendous strides. Uh, this is like a, a port city in Massachusetts. So um, the police force, you know, has come right out and said, if you have this stuff and you want to get rid of it, if you're nervous about it, like just call us. We're not going to arrest you for possession uh, because they don't want people to be nervous about being arrested. They want people to try and work towards getting better. Um, so I think when more places and more states start taking that stance um, and start looking at it more of as a disease, then um, something that's just going to hurt their community, I think that'll help improve greatly. I, um, I can talk about New York a little bit too. I think New York City um, and New York State has uh, been very progressive in their approach. Um, so in New York City, there's been a real push to get a lot of naloxone out into the streets, um, to your point about the Surgeon General. Um, and so uh, there was a program called the Leave Behind Program where um, the City Department of Health partnered with FDNY so that um, when FDNY EMS respond to an overdose, uh, they not only revive the person, but if the person refuses to go to the emergency room, which happens, they leave um, them with naloxone, um, either so that, you know, just to have more naloxone on the street, right? They also have, an, and this is true of some other states, um, a program, a peer program in the emergency department. So um, if a person comes in for an overdose, they're then linked to uh, a social worker, sometimes a nurse, peer that follows up with them. I know, I think in New York it's for 90 days um, to make sure that they have naloxone, help them with any uh, treatment access, that sort of thing. So trying to because um, we also know that when a person overdoses for the first time, they're at increased risk for an additional overdose. So trying to really hone in on, um, you know, just linking people with care, especially people that have overdosed for the first time who might not have the same level of education. Although, you know, again, I think, you know, fentanyl really is a game changer in 
in the um, respect that it's, it can be so potent and there's so much variability in how much of it is in the drug supply at any given time, any given bag n that no one knows about, uh, although there are programs that are trying to give out fentanyl test strips to detect whether or not there's fentanyl in, um, a drug s in any drugs. But trying to you know, link people with care earlier on, I think it is um, innovative and helpful. I can say um, one quick thing on that, which is that it's maybe a little bit hard to, um, at least in my mind, to compare um, different states to different states just because, um, you know, I was recently in West Virginia, um, in Huntington, West Virginia, and the, just the way healthcare services in general are delivered in New York versus West Virginia are very different. People are driving frequently in West Virginia, you know, two hours away um, to see any healthcare provider, let alone a mental and behavioral health provider. But um, one thing that strikes out to me or stands out to me as a kind of innovative practice or places um, like in Huntington, West Virginia, where they're investing in, um, integrated care and integrated training so that when people are, are presenting with a substance use disorder, um, they can visit their primary care doctor and also see a psychologist or another mental and behavioral health professional alongside. We know that you know science tells us that when mental health services and mental and behavioral health services are integrated into primary care services and specialty services, people are more likely to seek out those services. Um, there's less stigma involved with ha not having to go to a different location to seek out mental health care. Um, so places that are, uh, you know, institutions that are investing, states that are investing in these integrated practices so that people can get screened earlier um, and that they can get into the system earlier to, um, you know, help support recovery and help prevent it turning into a long-term addiction. I'll mentioned it at different times, and it's definitely a huge issue um, with mental and behavioral health care issues. Um, I'm curious, how have you guys seen the stigma around opioid and other drug addiction change in the past few years as this has become an issue in more places, and does that mean that people are more willing to seek treatment because it's being talked about more at a national and maybe in certain states, cer certainly on a statewide level? No. Sadly, no. Um, yeah, I was actually thinking about this, and I, I was going to make a comment because you brought it up a couple of times, both of you. Um, and yeah, I think stigma is, is a huge issue yeah. that is driving this. And I think, um, you know, I off, when I'm um, reading the paper and I see an obituary, particularly when it's a young person, it, you know, the cause of death is often not mentioned, and I'm often left to wonder. Um, whether or not the person um, died of an opioid overdose. Um, and I think, you know, it's tough and everyone needs to make their own decision, but I think that there is still massive stigma. And I think particularly on the side of um, people that are continuing to use or relapse and, and use again. And um, when I was doing this study with young people, the most recent study, um, I, ha I was interviewing a couple. They were both, uh, I think like 22, 23, um, and they were both parents. Um, their children had recently been taken from them, um, and the woman was pregnant with their third kid. And when I talked to them about, you know, what it was like being parents and you know having their kids taken, and um, they they both told me separately, um, but the dad was you know torn apart by it. He was saying like they were afraid to get help. They were really worried that their kids were going to get taken if they told someone that they um, were both addicted to heroin and that they needed to get treatment. They were terrified. And, and so they didn't even realize that they could actually ask for help. And, and they were worried that their kids would be taken. And as a result, their kids ended up being taken because things spiraled so far out of control. But I think you know, stigma is a, a huge problem with people seeking treatment um, and then also you know, hiding their drug use. That was the other, one of the other things that attracted me to Shane was when I read his obituary, his uh, family decided to state the cause of death as opposed to died suddenly. Because most of these say died suddenly. And you, you have to respect the family's decision to do that. Uh, absolutely understandable. But um, when a family is brave enough to kind of put it out there, and make it known, even, I mean, it was done very eloquently. It was after a long battle with addiction. Um, you know, when things like that start to happen, people start to humanize it a little bit more. Um, where, you know, died suddenly, you're just kind of a little bit more f further removed from it. Um, 
so I, you know that's one of the big things that Lisa always talks about Shane's mom is you know people kind of it needs to be talked about because it, you know it's not going anywhere um, but it, it's going to take a while and you know that people will feel more comfortable when it's more accepted from other angles um, so you know yeah I think the stigma issue too is huge um, and which is why I think documentaries like this are so great because there's it's getting better but there's stigma on Capitol Hill but Capitol Hill doesn't you know they didn't get it from it you know just out of thin air there's stigma pervasive throughout society and anything we can do to bring awareness to this topic and um, illuminate you know this kind of this view of addiction which is you know, evidence-based, it's backed by research that addiction is a chronic disease. Um, it's not a moral failing. It's not, um, you know, a personal choice, just like the doctor in the documentary said, nobody wakes up one day and says, you know, I'd really like to become addicted to drugs. It's not a situation like that. And it's, as a chronic disease, it's not a matter of somebody waking up the next day necessarily and deciding, oh, I'm not gonna do drugs today. Um, it's, very, it's much, you know, it's a complex medical condition. So anything we can do to move towards that and shift it away from either a moral failing or a criminal justice issue is um, a step in the right direction. Um, and one thing that I believe Lisa Shane's mom now works with um, other parents, I believe the video said. Yeah, she's super involved. Um, I actually, like every time I go home, I get we get coffee. Um, and this most recent time in the past few times, she said, oh, like I have a meeting or I'm going to meet up with other parents. And uh, she actually initiated one of the first um, statewide, rec like state recognized days in New Hampshire um, for just overdose awareness. Um, and so she's, she's become heavily involved with this. And, um, you know, I think it's hard for a lot of parents to do that because you don't want to talk about it. Uh, it's part of your life that there's nothing harder than losing a kid. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's it takes it's going to take a lot more parents like Lisa to do it. But at the same time, you have to respect the parents that don't want to. Um, but yeah, she's become very involved um, and a huge resource to a lot of other people. So I mean, she's she's awesome. Maybe in, in society generally reduce the stigmas when you have parents telling their personal stories, um, a moving film such as yours. Um, w w I think you brought up um, medication assisted treatment. Um, and I was hoping that we could maybe talk about that a little bit um, and sort of how this has moved forward and what some of the challenges in spreading that around are right now. Um, I think, you know, stigma is one part of it as well, even within the treatment system. Um, you know, uh, some like halfway houses and that sort of thing won't allow, not all, but some won't allow people to be there if they're on medication assisted treatment, which would be uh, buprenorphine, naltrexone, um, and methadone. Um, so, but we know that those are um, sort of the gold standard in terms of the evidence, right? So, um, so I think we have a ways to go. Um, I also think that a lot of people um, using opioids end up um, are sort of um, raised within that notion that um, that uh, medication assisted treatment isn't being clean, right? Because you're still um, using a medication. But to the extent that we can use sort of a diabetic model um, when we think about this, so when we think about um, diabetes and people using insulin um, and trying to make that analogy to really reduce um, the stigma and the way that people conceive of that. Um, because I think, you know, at least in my experience, people tend to use medication assisted treatment further along in their progression of addiction and so I think that's problematic um, you know people uh, often go into a detox a short-term detox um, for a couple of days as like a first step um, some people go into rehab which can be very effective for people especially long-term rehab um, but I think you know to the extent and when we're doing a good job of that I think we are increasing access to medication assisted treatment um, but I think we need to pull people in a little bit earlier on to that point I mean in New Hampshire in the film I think it said that New Hampshire had the third highest per capita overdose death overdose death rate while ranked like 49th for treatment being available. Yeah. Have you seen that change in the state since you've worked on this and have you you know did you talk to people in the state about how they were trying to improve those statistics? Um 
I haven't personally seen any uh, great strides by the government in New Hampshire. Um, one of the things is there's a lot of uh, stigma surrounding medical assisted treatment as well. Um, one story in particular, there was a a uh, public school administrator in the area in southern New Hampshire who was seen in line at a methadone clinic trying to get some help. Um, and she was fired um, for being seen and just someone mentioned it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's unacceptable. It's, it's the type of thing where, you know, it's understandable if someone has a problem you may not necessarily want your children exposed to it, but it's also the type of thing where this person is actively trying to get better uh, and making strides to do so. Um, so I think it, it falls back on stigma when it comes to states like New Hampshire, um, which has recently been predominantly, well, Republican. Um, so, you know, I, I think not to make it a partisan issue, but um, I think there needs to be a little bit more humanization and, you know, maybe films are a way to start. Maybe people getting, you know, on TV and telling their stories is a way to start. But, um, no, I haven't seen many great strides. I'm curious, what do you guys think um, are steps that states could take to try to get more people into assistive treatments? And how do you expand those when, you know, so much of healthcare is, as you kind of mentioned in West Virginia, just being able to get to a place where you can get some sort of treatment or having insurance to get that treatment covered? I think the fundamental part of the first step would be to, um, to address the access issue. Um, so that's huge. So investing in, you know, in, in places, um, places that are rural, investing in uh, telehealth services and things like that, it shouldn't be, I mean, if you want people to seek treatment, it shouldn't be incredibly hard for them to seek treatment. They're not going to seek treatment if it's incredibly hard, and that unfortunately is um, part of the issue. Um, another thing is related to the stigma. So I think by um, investing in programs that support long-term recovery, um, I think is a great way to get people in treatment in the first place. A lot of people grappling with addiction um, have an issue where they can't hold down a job or they have money issues or things like that. So having more um, programs that facilitate the reentry of people of you know previously with addiction problems re re -facilit to facilitate their reentry into society, um, jobs programs, things like that, peer support programs, um, housing, you know, recovery housing programs. I think um, I think would be uh, positive. That's one of the things Lisa talks about a lot too is uh, the fact that a twenty eight day program is really ineffective. Um, you know, in some cases. You know, some of uh, some of the people that we both still know are, uh, you know, actively trying to maintain sobriety uh, and stay well, um, and it's really difficult for them to do that. Um, you know, Lisa would like to see, you know, 18-month programs where, you know, it's like a year and a half, and um, there's more beds for people, and um, but that's just not the reality. Um, so, and, and the, the turnover rate for seeing people overdose for a second or third time after a 28-day program is really high. Um, so, you know, long-term, putting, putting an emphasis on long-term care is a super important part of that. I'm curious, do you think, um, Courtney, in terms of you, maybe, it, how can you get someone out of a, okay, Realistically, you have a 28-day program. What sorts of, you know, societal and just public types of programs might exist out there for people to, you know, after they go through a recovery period, a rehab rehabilitation program, to stay in recovery and continue to get those kind of services possibly? Well, I think some people, you know, might start with detox and then transition to a long-term inpatient program. And then other people might then go into a halfway house where they would live um, and they have responsibilities within the house. They can hold a job, but there's a there's a little bit more structure, and almost sort of, it's in a, almost a parental way. Um, and you know, some I have interviewed a bunch of people that find that very effective. Um, you know, other people not so much because you know, for instance, I, I interviewed someone that um, was on a methadone program, and they wouldn't let him live in that halfway house. So. 
But I think to the extent that you can, um, to your point, extend that period of time that um, people are in a sort of an active treatment, but also, you know, with medication-assisted treatment, people are often um, going into um, having groups and that sort of thing, so continuing to be engaged in treatment, particularly thinking, you know, we see a, a lot of, you know, if you had a Venn diagram, a lot of um, comorbidities with respect to mental health um, issues, and so to the extent that people can be working working on these things simultaneously, I think will help um, people remain, um, you know, uh, in treatment and not using drugs. All right, we are going to open it up for questions from the audience. So we have microphones on either side if you all want to come down and ask some questions. Alex, while we're waiting for these lines to come up, I want to ask you one more question in terms of the outlook for next Congress. Um, do you expect this to remain an issue um, and, you know, what sorts of hearings and oversight would you like to see in the next Congress after just passing H.R. 6 this past year? I think, um, as I said, H.R. 6 was a great step in the right direction. Um, I think this is going to continue to stay on um, the agenda for the next Congress just because um, this epidemic, it's not uh, stopping right now. Um, there's still so much more to go um, and there's so much to do. And just the nature of the issue, you know, looking at the last bill, um, I think it went through four, you know, maybe four Senate committees. Um, it amended or did something to almost every single federal agency. Like it's such a cross-cutting issue that um, I really just don't see it going away. All right, um, do you want to start with questions? Hi, yes. um, thanks for being here this evening to kind of shed light on this really important issue. Um, I'll get a little closer. Um, so you obviously don't need me to tell you that recovery from addiction is a lifelong struggle and people frequently relapse and there's comorbidities associated with it. So um, for me, I'm just curious, um, just for my own knowledge, um, about the success rates of treatment practices, the current ones for addiction, because um, my understanding is they're not very successful. Um, just coming from a family that I, you know, there is addiction in, in my family tree. Um, and what is being done to change treatment modalities to improve the success of treatment? I think a big thing that I've seen personally is there is not enough incentive put uh, or there's not enough emphasis put on treatment by states. So a lot of the treatment that we see in New Hampshire or other states are privately funded treatment centers. So you have people who may not be able to you know, even with insurance, may not be able to afford the bills that are left over from their 28-day program. Uh, they then have to shell out between seven and fifteen thousand dollars a month to live and have a bed. Um, and for some people, that's just not possible. For those who are lucky enough to do it, it's still not a great success rate. Um, in a lot of these places, there are drugs. Um, it's the type of thing where it, it needs to be government funded. Um, I think in a lot of ways, because there is now a business of treatment um, and there's people making money off of addicts. Um, and that's, you know, if not, not that a state run institution would necessarily be any better, um, but it, it eliminates, um, you know, I highly doubt you would be paying $15,000 to have a bed uh, if it was a state-run institution. I also just wanted to make a point that piggybacks on what Alex said earlier about thinking about um, substance use as a chronic condition. Um, and so this is something that people are, to your point as well, dealing with for their whole lives. Um, even if it means that they don't use again, they're still dealing with that struggle. So I think to the extent that we can reframe the way that we think about um, substance use and substance use disorder as a chronic condition, as opposed to um, this condition that once you get treatment, you're suddenly cured. I totally agree with uh, that um, and that, you know, just like um, viewing it, you know, similar to um, type two diabetes or cancer, uh, COPD, uh, there are factors of it that make it a chronic condition. The relapse is, you know, inevitable in some of these, you know, these conditions, they're remitting relapsing conditions. Um, there is, similar to, you know, type 2 diabetes, there's a genetic component. Um, it's influenced by, um, the onset and course of it is influenced by social factors, environmental factors, and also it does respond to 
uh, treatment, um, which often term, you know, at times require um, long-term lifestyle modification. So it shares many similarities with other conditions that are chronic and where relapse is um, expected. So, but it's not, you know, it's not a personal failing, it's just the nature of the addiction, the nature of the, the condition. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, by somewhat of a personal story, I just stopped taking Percocet after, um, well, six and a half weeks ago, I had my knee replaced, which is pretty brutal surgery. So I, after about five weeks, I started weaning myself from Percocet. I have to admit, I love the drug. I mean, I was pain-free, relatively speaking. I didn't feel my arthritic back. Um, I, I, I honestly... I have Percocet still at home. I'm not gonna take any more. One question I have is how to dispose of it, but one comment I have too is I, I don't really think the doctors gave me adequate advice, and it was a major medical center, I'm not gonna name it, about the, the possibilities of, of addiction. Um, I, I renewed the prescription for a third time, and I remember the doctor saying, let me know if you need more, and that didn't seem right. Maybe I should have read that six pages that the FDA <laughs> sends with every prescription, but I didn't. Um, I, I was also add, and I wonder, is NA effective for people who are addicted? I mean, I have family members that go to AA. I know what addiction is like. Is, is NA a possibility? Or a, a it's certainly one of the choices that people use, and I think it works for some people and not others. Yeah. I, I don't know the percent effectiveness of NA. I can't tell you that off the top of my head. But certainly, I mean, it is a popular form of treatment that people um, use on top of other types of treatment, you know, like to use on top of medication-assisted treatment, um, and then that they can kind of go back to or go consist. Some people go, you know, to meetings right. every day or several times a week you know, for 30, 40 years. Um, I wanted to um, make a point or answer your question about disposal. Um, so do not flush your, um, yeah, <laughs> your opioids that. down the toilet. But um, I know uh, oftentimes um, uh, pharmacies will take them back. They have take back uh, programs. And they didn't actually. Oh, really? When I went. My local pharmacy does. Okay, um, I'm and ask. police stations too um, oh, really? will. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of your point about it doesn't sound like there was even a conversation before you were prescribed opioids. There wasn't a conversation about your history of opioid use. I mean, I think that is something that needs, you know, on the provider side in, in terms of education, um, that is a conversation that should be had every time a person is prescribed opioids. They I, should I be asked so about their yeah. history. Um, and assumptions shouldn't be made based on your age or your race or your ethnicity or your gender about whether or not you, you know, fit the profile of someone who might have an opioid addiction. You know, I think that we uh, providers should be using the same protocol regardless of all of those demographic factors when they're prescribing someone opioids. Thank you. I'm going to limp back upstairs. To elaborate on your question, um, it already passed for this year, but every year the government sponsored recently National Drug Take Back Day, which is a chance to go and get rid of um, you know, narcotics that you don't have regularly, and that might be at a pharmacist or a police station, but that's something that I've seen more awareness of you know, every fall in the past couple of years. And um, to your point about um, prescribing practices, you know, I know that's something that lawmakers have discussed a lot. It's very difficult to legislate on necessarily, um, but the AMA has had a lot of conversations about this, of how do we change, you know, how doctors are learning in medical school about how to prescribe narcotics. And I would imagine that it's largely, you know, a doctor who has more experience with it might have more, more to say about it than a doctor who hasn't had as much experience. I know, I know the police station, most police stations, if you go like in their lobby now, have, it almost looks like a mailbox. Oh, really? Uh, and you can just, they usually don't ask any questions, um, and you can kind of just dump them in there. Cool. Thank you. That's good to know. Hi. Uh, I kind of, you, you'd mentioned earlier more innovative kind of forms of treatment in different cities, and also, it was also mentioned uh, mental health and how that plays into it. I just wanted to know if, uh, if any of you had come by examples or research of mental health treatment where uh, culture, religion, and kind of spirituality had been integrated into it, or there was more of an emphasi emphasis of spirituality within that. Yeah, just because right now I'm kind of like writing a paper about that <laughs> with, um, 
Yeah, essentially, like, uh, me and my group are here right now and writing a paper for NYU for end of year. And it's about the opioid epidemic, specifically within uh, Native American uh, reservations. And it's definitely hit uh, those areas and uh, those communities much, uh, much stronger, and it's kind of overlooked. And a lot of the research that we've done, treatment seems to be, or a lot of the treatment, or like a lot of the research that's coming out says that that seems to be what's very effective in those uh, specific communities. So I just want to know if you had any input. I, well, I went to a conference uh, about Eastern medicine being used to treat addiction. Um, and it's also the type of thing where it's not really being taken seriously here yet um, because I'm not sure if a doctor can prescribe it, um, but for some reason, whenever a doctor can prescribe something, it's taken more seriously. Um, but they were talking about how uh, you could use things like um, acupuncture and uh, you know things of that nature uh, to try and start treating addiction and, and sort of getting into a healthier mindset holistically. Um, but yeah. Um, I think one really important, so the Native American population, you know, they suffer from um, a large amount of mental health problems and substance use disorder problems, and unfortunately, they have, you know, some of the lowest treatment rates. And I think a huge part of that is um, lack of cultural competency on the part of providers um, and just a matter, you know, traditionally how they use health services, they don't feel comfortable going outside necessarily their reservations to seek health care services. So states um, who have been very... Um, effective in helping Native populations have, um, uh, one of the things that they've done is they've uh, provided subsidies or things for Native American individuals to go to school to become psychologists or social workers or things like that so they can return to their reservations, which they most frequently do, and provide services. Thank you. Hi. Um, so coming up during this this winter break that's about to occur. I'm a student here at NYU and we're about to go on winter break. I am supposed to be getting my wisdom teeth pulled out. And I know from experience, a lot of my friends have taken the drug, drugs that were prescribed to them and I've had some friends who have uh, rejected the drugs entirely, rejected the prescription or got the prescription and didn't use them. But they have said that they experienced a lot of pain because they didn't take the drugs. So what are my options and my alternatives to these drugs? According to that recent JANIMA paper, which you could <laughs> read the most recent issue of Journal of <laughs> American Medical Association, um, uh, ibuprofen is just as effective, if not more. Um, but have you had conversations with your physician about this? Not yet, no. So I would you know, urge that first um, and try and, um, and you might want to do a little bit of research. But according to the study, um, uh, ibuprofen is more effective than opioids in dealing with pain. Um, but I would you know, talk to your, I am not a physician. <laughs> I'm the other kind of doctor. Um, and so I would talk to your physician to see, and just have a, try and have an honest conversation with your physician about it. Thank you. What's the brand for uh, ibuprofen? Advil. Advil. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. This is a great forum. Um, I sort of want to ask a very different question than sort of a lot of these non-pharmacological treatments. I really want to put the focus on the biochemical treatment because I really believe this is a brain disease. And once we understand the brain, there would be no longer this notion that it is a moral failing or that the person has to be saved. Like I was very taken by Shane being baptized and that somehow that was associated. I'm not saying that that can't inspire people, but I'm really worried that there's not enough scientific information. So I wanted to ask, is there any national database that really looks at what's working and what's not? Because I have not heard in any systematic way, the way we know about diabetes and other chronic conditions, what works and what really has a very low percentage. Not that it doesn't help anybody, but by and large, what's helping people? Well, I think within the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, this is the, their focus. So um, they fund research like mine, but they also fund a lot of brain science research, that, which is, <coughs> excuse me, a trying to move uh, treatment and effective treatment forward. Um, so that's certainly the 
charge of NIDA and what they do. In terms of funding that the Congress has given to NIH, um, they have given funding for research on opioids in terms of, you know, how do you research the disease itself as well as treatment and other responses to it. All right, well, if that's everything, um, any final thoughts from our panelists tonight? Okay, great, well, thank you all so much. Thank you.